Hi, everyone. Welcome to another round of Bilkent Micro Webinar Series. Today, we are very happy to have Camille Terrier um, from University of Lausanne. Uh, so Camille, the floor is yours. Um, you have like 90 minutes to use, but it's up to you how to use it. Uh, so the participants can just ask questions in Q&A and I'll try to interrupt uh, the talk and ask the questions or if you are a panelist, you can just unmute yourself and ask a question. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, thanks so much for, uh, for inviting me to give this seminar. I'm uh, really happy to present. Um, so it's a joint work I'm presenting today with uh, Julien Combe from the École Polytechnique and uh, Olivier Tercieux from PSC. And we started working on this quite a long time ago when I was still doing my, my PhD in Paris. So it's, it's a work on the, um, the assignment of teachers to schools. And, okay. and so one of the, um, of the motivation for this work is the well-known fact that teachers are very important determinant of student achievement. So we know in the in economics of education, in the literature, that the value added of a teacher is a key determinant of student success in schools and even after school. And so once we've said that, I think it really raises two important questions. The first one is, if teachers are so important, how do we attract and retain good teachers in the economics profession? And so when we ask this question, we know that the working conditions uh, of the teachers are very important determinant of the attractiveness of the teaching profession. And in these working conditions, teachers' ability to select the school in which they teach in the first place, and then their ability to change school whenever they want, are two very important determinants of these working conditions, and therefore of the attractiveness of the teaching profession down the line. And so we see here that teacher satisfaction is an important aspect of this question. I think a second question um, that derives from the fact that teachers are such an important determinant of student achievement is how do we allocate teachers across schools and how do we make sure that all students have an equal access to good teachers, whatever we call good teachers. And here we see that schools uh, usually want effective teachers, they, want, they usually want teachers with uh, a bit more experience, or at least not at the very beginning of their career. Um, and schools also tend to value local teachers uh, because this might reduce the risk of turnover. If a teacher has a strong local attachment, the probability that the teacher would leave after a few years might be lower. So we see that when we ask these questions of how can we distribute teachers across schools, here what schools value and what schools want is a very important determinant or, or uh, aspect of this question. Um, and so in this, in this project, we try to understand how can we design an assignment procedure for teachers that takes into account these two considerations. First, the satisfaction of teachers um, and what schools need and what schools want. And so in our paper, we introduce a new assignment process and then we empirically quantify what are the gains uh, that would be that we would get if we were switching from the current uh, assignment mechanism to the alternative mechanisms that we suggest. And so if we think about the assignment of teachers to schools, there are broadly speaking uh, two ways in which the labor markets are organized. Um, one, the first one, which might be the more Standard is a fully decentralized uh, assignment of teachers to schools. Maybe I shouldn't even call it assignment. So it's a standard labor market where teachers um, apply to positions directly. Um, and so they can send their CV and they have interviews with the principals. And so this is a, a decentralized way. Uh, this is usually the way the labor market for teachers works in the US, uh, in the UK or in Sweden. The second way the labor market can be organized is through a centralized assignment system. Uh, so this is how it works in Mexico, for instance, in Turkey, in Uruguay, um, in Europe, Italy also has a centralized assignment system for teachers to schools or Portugal. And um, obviously France also has a centralized assignment system where every year about 90,000 teachers ask for an assignment. It can be their first assignment for teachers who have just been recruited or it can be a reassignment. And I, I come back to these um, institutional um, features. So France will be the, 
the empirical application in this paper will be based on, on France. And so how does it work? When we have these centralized assignment systems, um, it's actually very similar to all the literature on school choice. So teachers are asked to submit a ranked list of schools or regions to the administration. On the other side of the market, schools have different admission criteria uh, and they rank the teachers um, based on admission criteria and on priorities. And then based on these two inputs, the preferences submitted by teachers and the priorities of the schools, a central administration is using an algorithm and is assigning teachers to schools. And so the algorithm gives a single assignment for every teacher. And so the way we think about the assignment of teachers to schools is actually very similar to the way we think about the assignment of students to schools. And there is a very large literature on school choice and college admissions, but there is one fundamental difference in the way we think about these assignment uh, processes. And it's that when we think about how we, how we assign teachers to schools, many teachers initially have a position. And so these teachers, for instance, if they only submit a list with two schools and they don't get into any of these two schools, we would like them to be able to keep their current position instead of being either unassigned or to be assigned to a different region that they didn't rank. So you see that, that that's a, a, a fundamental difference, um, which is in the individual, uh, individual, individual rationality constraint, which makes that teachers should uh, or ideally we would like to give teachers the possibility to keep their current position if they don't obtain any of uh, the schools that they rank in, in their list. And so it's, it's a very small difference, but it has um, a very clear consequence in terms of how we think about the assignment of teachers to schools. Uh, because in order to fulfill this uh, individual rationality constraint, one way to uh, ensure IR is to use a variation of the deferred acceptance mechanism. It's a very simple variation in which we give every teacher the highest priority in their current region. And I'll come back. Uh, I detailed all this much more. But so it's a very simple modification. And so in practice, this simple modification or tweak of the DA uh, algorithm is used in France to assign teachers to regions and then teachers to schools. It's also used in, in other contexts, for instance, for the, the allocation of on-campus housing at MIT. They use the same uh, algorithm. And so we see, I mean, it's very straightforward to see why we impose this like modification uh, on the priorities of the teachers in order to make DA individually rational. What we show in the paper is that this, what we call this modified deferred acceptance, uh, it's actually very costly to impose individual rationality to DA. Um, and so we show that this modified DA fails to be efficient in a very strong sense. And so this failure is that we could improve upon the assignment uh, or the allocation under the modified DA in terms of efficiency for teachers and for schools and in terms of fairness. So, and we could improve in these three dimensions simultaneously. Um, and so one of our contribution, once we've shown this uh, cost of imposing, um, of using the modified version of DA, um, we design assignment mechanisms that in contrast to the modified DA cannot be improved upon in terms of efficiency for teachers and schools and in terms of fairness. And so maybe Something that is slightly unusual in the way we think about this assignment problem is that we consider not only um, teachers as welfare relevant entities, but also schools. Um, and so usually in the school choice literature, uh, schools are considered as having priorities and using criteria uh, and not necessarily as having preferences of the teachers. And so we think that in the, in the, when we think about the assignment of teachers to schools, it makes sense to consider both schools' welfare and, um, and teachers' welfare, because even if schools per se don't have preferences of the teachers, the, school, the criteria that are used by schools reflect very clear social objectives from the policymakers. And so what do I mean by these social objectives? 
the, the, the criteria that is used for all teachers, for instance, is experience. So all schools um, tend to prefer teachers with higher experience than teachers with low, lower experience. And this is kind of reflecting the fact that um, the social planner perceives a distribution uh, or an assignment of higher, ex uh, more experienced teachers to schools as um, um, a favorable uh, outcome. Obviously, it's a zero-sum game, so you cannot reallocate. Um, I mean, you cannot give all schools higher uh, experienced teachers, but because some of the, um, the criterion are uh, school teacher specific, like whether the teacher is comes from the, the local area. Um, in that case, the idea is that maybe you, you want a teacher that is slightly less experienced, but that teacher is coming from this area. And in that case, we really believe that uh, having either a more experienced teacher or a teacher uh, that grew up in this area or that was born in this area, both would um, increase the welfare and the satisfaction of the, the preferences of the schools for these teachers. So both for the, for the, the in, it would enter both um, the preference function for the schools and for the policy makers. Um, and so in this paper, what we show uh, is we, we basically proceed in three steps. First, we show theoretically that the modified version of deferred acceptance can perform poorly in terms of efficiency and fairness. Then we suggest alternative mechanisms that perform better in terms of efficiency and fairness, while keeping the, the good strategy proofness uh, properties. And then in the second part of the paper, um, we empirically assess the gains uh, that we would obtain if we were switching from the current mechanism to uh, the alternative mechanisms we suggest. And in order to do this um, quantification of the gains, we use data on the assignment of uh, teachers to region, regions. We estimate, we start by estimating the preferences of the teachers. And then based on these um, estimated preferences, we run counterfactuals. So we predict what would be the submitted list of teachers, and then we run counterfactuals. And once we have the counterfactual allocations, we can compare uh, the welfare of teachers, the welfare of schools, the fairness of the, make of the allocations that we obtain. And so just to give you a very quick preview of the results, we find that in uh, moving from the current mechanism to um, the mechanism we call the teacher optimal block exchange that I will present uh, would multiply by more than two, close to three, the number of teachers who obtain a new allocation. And so in the rest of the presentation, um, I start by presenting the theory. So I discuss the, the environment in which we are. The, I present the modified version of deferred acceptance, uh, the alternative mechanisms that we um, design and propose, so the block exchange mechanism and the teacher optimal version of this block exchange mechanism that we call 2B. And then uh, in the second part, uh, I present the empirical analysis. So I show how we estimate teachers' preferences and uh, what are the results of the counterfactual analysis that we, that we do. So let me start with the theory. So in terms of environments, we consider, um, obviously when we think about the assignment of teachers to schools, we have the full environment would have some teachers that initially have a position and want to be reassigned, but we also have some newcomers. So these are the teachers that just uh, graduated and would like to get the first assignment. Um, so these are the unassigned teachers, and we also have vacant positions. So most of the positions initially have a, have a teacher, but we have vacant positions, and these are the positions that were left by usually, most likely, the teachers who retired. So in, in, in terms of theory, um, the novelty from the, our approach is really the, the fact that some teachers have an initial position and that we consider reassignment of teachers rather than first assignment of teachers. Because if we were in a market where all teachers were newcomers and we had vacant positions, you see that the question and the environment would be very similar or would be equal, um, corresponding to school choice I mean, uh, environment. So the novelty here is really the fact that teachers have an initial assignment. Um, so for the theory, we focus on this market of teachers with an initial assignment, omitting newcomers and omitting vacant positions. And also to simplify the theory, 
uh, we, uh, we consider one-to-one -one environment, even if most of the results do um, hold when we consider a many-to-one environment. And then for the empirical uh, part, we actually keep, we also do the counterfactual analysis on this market of initially assigned teachers, but we, we also have now in the, in the paper, I'm not going to present the results for the full market, but we have results uh, where we expand the market from uh, the teacher with an initial assignment to the full market where we incorporate newcomers and back-end positions as well. Um, and so when we consider the desirable properties of the mechanisms, and then when we quantify the gains, uh, we, we consider very standard uh, properties of the mechanisms. The first one is the efficiency. So I mentioned already that we consider efficiency from, uh, for teachers and for schools. And we adopt the uh, Pareto, standard Pareto efficiency uh, criteria where uh, we are uh, we, we reach an efficient allocation if it's not possible to reallocate uh, to improve the situation or the allocation of one teacher without uh, reducing the welfare or the allocation of at least another teacher. We consider these for both teachers and schools. We also use a very standard definitions of fairness where we've reached uh, a fair allocation if there are no blocking pairs. So there is no teacher that would have preferred another school to the school that he or she receives. And that teacher has a higher priority than at least some of the teachers that have been assigned to that school. So if there are no blocking pairs, we say that the allocation is, is fair or is stable. We also use standard definitions of strategy proofness for teachers where teachers uh, don't have any incentives to misreport their true preferences and the reported, uh, the reported preferences are truthful. And finally, uh, I think in the teacher allocation uh, problem, a very important requirement is individual rationality where teachers should get an assignment that they really prefer to their current assignment. Um, can I ask something sure. about the efficiency criterion? So I get that you need to sort of care about the school's preferences because there is a social objective behind them. But some of the examples that you have given about the social objective makes me think that maybe those objectives are already reflected in the teacher's preferences. Like the mm -hmm. school prefers a local teacher uh, the teacher presumably also prefers to be assigned to a local school and etc. So should I expect at least some of these social objectives not to be reflected in teachers' preferences? Yeah, yeah, that's a good, uh, that's a good point. Um, I think that so for the local, uh, it's true that in in a sense, um, teachers tend to have a preference for the region or the schools, uh, usually the region where they grew up. It's not only the region where they grew up, it's also the region where their uh, current partner is located, which I think is, goes hand in hand. I mean, the, the school might prefer to have teachers that have a good reason, personal reason to come back, basically. So it's true for this. I think for um, the experience of teachers, schools tend to prefer teachers with more experience, but some teachers, uh, I mean, here there is more heterogeneity in the preferences of the teachers because teachers might not want to go to disadvantaged schools, typically. So th this is where I think, uh, and we'll see that it's one of the, the results we show, that um, there is quite a lot of difference in the preferences of teachers across regions. There are some disadvantaged regions that teachers don't like, but these regions would, they do all similarly uh, like experienced teachers. And so in that case, I think there is more of a mismatch between the preferences of the schools and the preferences of the teachers, of the teachers, yes. Thank you. Um, okay, so now that I presented the, the environment we consider for the theory, um, I present the, the modified version of the deferred acceptance. 
algorithm. So I think that many of you might be uh, familiar with the deferred acceptance, but I, I still uh, quickly remind how this works. So in the before presenting the modified version of DA, I'm presenting the standard deferred acceptance where we proceed step by step. Teachers are submitting ranked list of preferences. Schools receive applications in the first step. So schools, each teacher is applying to his or her favorite school. The schools are ranking teachers by decreasing order of priorities. They are rejecting all teachers. Maybe they have 100 seats. They, accept, they temporarily accept the 100 top teachers and reject the other teachers. And what is important here is that this is a, a temporary acceptance. And then in the second step, all the teachers that have been rejected in the first step would apply to the school they rank second in their list uh, and the school at that step would consider all the candidates that it had accepted temporarily in the first round and the new applicants from the second round, it's resorting all candidates by decreasing order of priority and accepting the top 100 candidates if it, had 100, if it has 100 seats. Um, and so we proceed in that way with temporary acceptance at every step until there are no more teachers that are rejected. So this is the very standard definition of deferred acceptance. Now you see with this um, deferred acceptance that the main issue we face when we consider running this standard deferred acceptance for teacher allocation is that DA is not individually rational. And a very simple example to see this is if we consider a teacher who is initially from Grenoble, the region of Grenoble, which is where I grew up, for instance, um, and this teacher has a preference for only two regions, which are Toulouse and Bordeaux. This teacher might, in differ, if we run the standard version of deferred acceptance, the teacher would apply to Toulouse, might be rejected from Toulouse in the first round. So in the second round, the teacher would apply to Bordeaux. He might also be rejected from Bordeaux. And so in the third round, in the current version of deferred acceptance, in the standard version of deferred acceptance, there is no... Uh, inference that the teacher could stay in Grenoble, which is his or her initial assignment, the teacher might end up either unassigned or the teacher, if the ministry really doesn't want to have any unassigned teachers, the ministry might fill in the list so that the teacher would end up in a region that is less preferred than the initial region. And so in order to avoid uh, this violation of, individually, of individual rationality, uh, a very simple to implement solution is to use a modified version of deferred acceptance that we call uh, DA star uh, through the paper uh, that has been introduced in a number of papers. Um, and so the, tr the, the trick consists in artificially modifying schools rankings. So when that teacher, for instance, was, sub was submitting two preferences, Toulouse and Bordeaux, then we would introduce as a third preference the initial region of the teacher or the initial school of the teacher. So in that case, uh, Grenoble. And in the ranking of the initial region, all teachers that are initially assigned that region would have the highest priority. So we artificially modify the priorities of every region so that the teacher that are initially assigned the region get the highest priority. And so this is the very simple modification we implement. And then we run the standard deferred acceptance on these modified preferences and priorities. And so you see that if we go back to the previous example where the teacher had been rejected from Toulouse and Bordeaux, now the teacher in the third step of the deferred acceptance algorithm would apply to uh, Grenoble. And the teacher by definition would have the highest priority in his or her initial assignment so that the teacher in the worst case scenario would stay in his or her current position. So that's the very simple modification that makes sure that um, DA star, the modified version of DA, is individually rational by definition, is strategy per for teachers, and it's the mechanism that is currently used in France to assign um, teachers. And so as I mentioned, it's also used in other environments where uh, we want to reassign uh, people between objects like for um, on-campus um, housing at MIT, for instance. And so what we show next is that imposing these small modification in the priorities of the regions where the teachers are initially assigned, it can be very costly in terms of mobility and therefore in terms of efficiency. 
of the allocation we obtain. So if we use this simple example where we have three teachers and all of them have an initial assignment, teacher one is initially assigned school one, teacher two is initially assigned school two, and teacher three is initially assigned school three. We also um, assume that teacher three is a high priority teacher. So let's assume that teacher three is just the, more ex the most experienced teacher and school three tends to be uh, a very, the, the, the least preferred school of all of them. And so typically in France, you know, the, the, the disadvantaged schools tend to be in the suburbs of Paris. So there are two regions close to Paris that are Créteil and Versailles. Versailles is well known for the castle and the, the king's uh, uh, city and town. But apart from this small town, the region, the rest of the region is actually very disadvantaged. And so these two regions, Créteil and Versailles, I'll come back to it because these are two regions that really gather most of the mobility requests out, most of the outgoing mobility requests every year. Um, and very few teachers are asking to go to these regions. And I, I'll show you these in the descriptive statistics. So let's imagine typically that we have a pretty experienced teacher from one of these disadvantaged regions in this example. And so the example, the rest of the example in terms of preferences and priorities is quite straightforward in the sense we assume that these two teachers that are not initially in disadvantaged regions, they would like to exchange their positions. So teacher one, for instance, in terms of preference, would like to go to school two. Teacher two would like to go to school one but they don't want to go to school three. So in when we look at the preferences of the teachers, everyone is ranking school three in the last position. And um, we also assume that the schools, uh, because teacher three has the highest priority, all the schools tend to prefer uh, teacher three to the other teachers. And so if we run, now based on this kind of very simple example, if we run the modified version of deferred acceptance on this example, what happens is that, so teacher one will apply to the school uh, she ranks first, which is school two. Teacher two would apply to school one. And teacher three would apply to school one. So this is the, the application in step one of the modified A. We have two applicants in school one. We know that teacher three has the highest priority so that teacher two would be Teacher, one, uh, teacher three would be temporarily accepted and teacher two would be rejected. What happens in the second step is because teacher two has been rejected from the only school he wanted to go to. So in the second step, oh yeah, and I, I should say that in the first step, also teacher one has been temporarily accepted in school two. In step two, teacher two that has been rejected from school one will just apply to his school of initial assignment which is school two, because he really doesn't want to go to school three, so he would never apply there. He's applying there. And so in the second step, teacher one, who had been temporarily accepted in school two, will be rejected from school two because the teacher that was initially assigned school two is applying. And because of the modification of the priorities we impose now, um, teacher two has the highest priority. And so then teacher, um, the teachers will apply to their school of initial assignment. And so when teacher three will be rejected from school one, because teacher one then is also applying after having been rejected from school two, teacher one applies to school one. By applying to school one, teacher one is rejecting teacher three. And so teacher three would at some point apply to school two, but is rejected because teacher two, the initial teacher, which has the mechanical highest priorities accepted. So in the end, teacher three will just end up applying to the school he likes the least, school three. And you see that the final match we get under this modified version of DA is that no one is moving. Teacher one is staying in school one, teacher two is staying in school two, and teacher three is staying in school three. Um, and so obviously you could say that this is a, a stylized example and that it's, it's a bit extreme, but it's just to illustrate um, where the inefficiency of, deferred, of the modified version of deferred acceptance is coming from. It's coming from any situation where we have some differences in the attractiveness of the regions, some regions that are relatively in, unattractive. And in these regions, we have at least one teacher with a high priority. And we show you in the data that this is not an isolated example because we quantify 
how often this kind of lack of mobility generated by high priority teachers from disadvantaged regions happens, and it happens a lot. Um, so we are in this situation where we don't have any mobility under the modified version of deferred acceptance. And yet, if you remember the preferences, if we were switching the positions between teacher one and teacher two, we would improve the satisfaction of teacher one who prefers school two to school one. We would improve the satisfaction of teacher two or the welfare of teacher two because teacher two prefers school one to school two. And we would also improve um, the priorities of the teachers that are assigned school one and school two because school two was ranking teacher one above teacher two and vice versa. School one was ranking uh, teacher two above teacher, teacher one. So by permuting, by allowing these two teachers to exchange their position, we would improve the uh, efficiency for teachers, the efficiency for schools, and also in the current situation, we have a blocking pair here between uh, teacher one, um, school one, and teacher two, school two, because teacher one had a higher priority than teacher two in school two, and teacher two had a higher priority than teacher one in school one. And so by allowing this exchange, we would not only improve the efficiency for teachers and for schools, we would also reduce the number of blocking pairs. So we would improve the fairness of the allocation. Um, and so this is, I think this, the, the reason I spend quite some time on this example is that it's really giving the intuition of what we, uh, what we suggest next in, the, in terms of alternative mechanisms. So maybe it's a good time for me to stop and ask if there is any question. Yeah, excellent timing. So and I hope you can hear me. Uh, so what you claim is that this modified version of the DA is not always producing stable assignments, right? How could so, that be? So yeah, there is, so um, it is, so you see that there is a blocking pair here. The so thing is, but that is, okay. Oh, the blocking uh, pair. So I mm -hmm. think your question might be related to, it depends on the concept of stability that you're considering. If you, yeah, if you consider a concept of stability, so here there is a blocking pair, but you see that the only blocking pairs that exist under the modified version of deferred acceptance are um, blocking pairs related to the fact that teachers are staying in their position. You never have a blocking pair that exists because a teacher is joining a school. So this is, a, this is a very important distinction. And this is actually a distinction that we don't introduce. It was a distinction from the paper by um, Gillen and Keston on acceptable, they don't need call uh, acceptable, it's uh, appropriate, uh, appropriate blocking pair and inappropriate blocking pairs. So you see that here in this situation, what I call this blocking pair that exists is teacher one has justified envy for school two but, but it's accepted by the policymakers because, teacher, because individual rationality is considered as more important than stability in a sense. I understand. That is, that is what I think uh, I, I, I would also ask. So the, the reason, okay, here is the thing. You are checking for stability by taking into account the original preferences, priorities of the schools. Yeah. You check for the stability before you move these already assigned agents to the top. Okay, yeah. but then, fine, understood. But then, okay, then why should I care about this modified deferred acceptance at all? Give me, I mean, uh, here is the thing. Uh, the property, the nice property of the deferred acceptance is being uh, student optimal, or in this case, teacher optimal stable assignment given these priorities. Why don't I directly look at that particular assignment? Do not describe it by using this modified version of the assignment. Take these priorities, the modified ones, and look at the teacher optimal stable metric, which is going to be produced by, by looking at these modified priorities. Uh, 
What I am telling is that if you are going to check for the stability by looking at the original preferences, then in some sense, of course, looking at the modified deferred acceptance does not make any sense to begin with. Forget about making you know, welfare gains out of that or not. But, uh, why would I look at this deferred acceptance, modified version of the deferred acceptance thing? My understanding is that it would be, okay, let me try to tell it like this. It would be more fair to deferred acceptance, modified deferred acceptance to judge it on the basis of these updated priorities, because that is what you decide for. Uh, schools in some sense are giving the consent that, look, if a teacher is assigned to us, then in some sense we are giving that the highest priority. Indeed, this is in line with the idea of a priority. It is like, you know, if the teacher has his wife or husband in our school already employed, then I am giving this guy a priority. This is like that. This teacher himself is already in your school and you are putting him on top of your priority. Indeed, again, I'm, pretty, I'm, I'm uh, curious that how is it possible to, to understand what is the priority of a teacher X who is already employed at your school? You should, you should be telling to me, okay, if this guy would not be employed in my school, I would put him in this priority. But now, since he is in my school, I'm putting him somewhere else. Um, so that is the part that uh, I think uh, I would like to be critical in some sense. Then if we exclude this, if we modify the problem, if we look at according to these modified priorities, then the concept in here is no different than the interrupted interrupting agent of uh, CASPEN, the old paper, the QGE paper, school choice with consent. Uh, the mechanism that drives the Pareto inferiority of the DA, DA outcome is existence of these interrupting agents, which prevails in here in the very same way. That's all I would like to say. Thanks. Okay, thanks. Um... I, I, I talked a lot, sorry. No, 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 that's, that's very useful. Uh, thanks. I, um, I should have these, so this interrupting agent from in the, um, I don't have the paper in mind, to be honest. Uh, I, so I can't, uh, on the, um, yeah, I should check. Um, okay, okay, sure, sure. Uh, thanks. Um, okay, so I don't know if there were any other uh, questions before I move to the modified version of. Before the, the there is a question in the Q and A. Um, can I yep. allow the so Dahan is sure. asking that question. I I can actually ask him to I think unmute himself if he is if he wants to ask him it himself um okay thanks arda um uh, this this is sorry this is not really a question this is this is a comment this is elaborating on uh, the point that kemal Hoja made so my understanding was that uh, da is generally fine if all of the all of the teachers are initially unassigned and all of the schools are initially unassigned but if you have some teachers assigned to, like, say, a, 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 mediocre, a mediocre school at that star, those teachers might refrain from participating to a standard DA matching system in fear that they might, be, uh, they might lose their position to an inferior school. So the modified DA, uh, the, the modified DA helps in a way that it gives correct incentives to all of the teachers to participate into the system. So no teacher is afraid anymore of losing its original position to an inferior school um, because she was, she, was bidding on a, she was bidding on a better place. Um, so in that sense, it, it, I mean, me, it makes sense uh, to compare, to, to take the, this modified DA as a benchmark and, and compare incentive properties to, to the modified DA. Uh, yeah. But I don't know if that contributes to the discussion, or I don't know. Yeah, yeah. My, uh, no, so no, I think uh, yeah, I could, I can uh, provide an answer to this, and also maybe to to um, Kemal's point. 
Um, so clearly from the ministry's point of view, when we exchange with them, having a mechanism that is not individually rational is not acceptable because it would, it would be a very strong disincentive for teachers to participate in the mobility because they would have a risk. I mean, it would be, it would be way too risky for teachers to participate. So I think that the point you, you in a sense, if we see the different properties of, a, of, the, of the assignments, considering fairness, individual rationality and, and efficiency, clearly the ministry seems to put at the top uh, the first requirement is to have individual rationality and conditional on that, they might consider mechanisms at all fair. So I think that this might answer your point, which is indeed from the ministry's perspective, um, the risk of um, discouraging people, people from or teachers from participating uh, would be too high if the mechanism was not individually rational. That's why they go for this modified version of DA, even if it might be costly. Then maybe came out to, to answer partly you, your point is I think one question is why would we consider the priorities that the which priority should we care about do schools so all the modified priorities kind of fake just to achieve individual rationality or should we really consider these priorities which one of the closest to be the true preferences of the schools maybe and I think that one thing that is quite clear is that the modified priorities where you give the top priority to the teachers that are initially assigned a school, these teachers by definition want to leave the school. So I agree with you that, I mean, it's not, it's not completely clear which priorities should be uh, considered as, as all the most relevant. What is clear is that uh, for a school, trying to retain teachers who don't want to stay in the school might not be optimal at all in the sense that these teachers, if they don't get their mobility request this year, are very likely to ask the, to leave the school again or to submit another um, request for mobility in subsequent years. And also even in terms of value of the teachers, it's not clear, I mean, it's not clear that schools uh, in their preferences prefer to have teachers that are initially assigned to a new incoming teacher. Um, so I agree with you that, I mean, I think it's, it's a very fair point. Um, the, the final answer, whether schools, where do schools actually value their existing teachers compared to other incoming teachers? I think it's not so clear that schools would have a very strong preference for the teachers that are initially assigned that school for this reason that these are teachers who want to leave. And so I think that the motivation of these teachers might be quite low if they stay in the school and that many schools might actually prefer to have new teachers coming in. That I agree, I agree with that, yeah, but okay, at that point I would ask, but that fundamental, that uh, actual priority of the schools, is it observable? Yes. Can I, so it is observable in your setting, right? Yes. Okay, fine, fine, fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so we do, yeah. All right, but yeah, no, I think it's, I mean, it's a fair point um, of which priorities are, which priorities are the most likely to truly reflect the, the preferences of the schools. Um, okay, so once we've said that um, the modified version of deferred acceptance um, is quite co costly in terms of mobility, and therefore in terms of uh, efficiency for teachers in schools and in terms of fairness. Uh, we design an alternative mechanism. Uh, and so I will present first the block exchange mechanism. And so we propose a class of mechanisms that in contrast to the modified version of deferred acceptance that I just presented, these class of mechanisms are individually rational, both for teachers and for schools. And perhaps most importantly, they don't have another matching that Pareto dominates for both sides, so for teachers and for schools, and is more fair. Uh, and so this is the definition of a two-sided maximal matching. And so um, let me now present the, the block exchange mechanism more specifically. So if two teachers, it's a very simple, I mean, and I think based on the example, it's a very intuitive mechanism. So if two teachers have justified ND for each other's school, we allow these teachers to exchange their schools. And so more formally, what we 
um, we propose the, 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 the way we define the block exchange algorithm is that we fix an initial assignment. We build a graph where the vertices are the set of teachers and their initial assignment. Um, and then we add an arrow from a teacher and his or her assignment to another teacher uh, and assignment if there is a blocking pair between these two. So you see that this is exactly what I, I showed in the, in the example. If there is no cycle, we end the algorithm. If there is a cycle, we implement it. Uh, we identify the new allocation and uh, we identify the new cycles again. And so we repeat these steps until there is no more cycle. And so if we go back to the previous example, where this allocation was the initial allocation and it was also the allocation we would obtain um, after uh, having run the modified version of deferred acceptance. And so we said that we identified uh, a blocking pair between teacher one and school two and uh, between these two. Um, and so if we exchange, if we allow these teachers to exchange their position, then we would just swap teacher one and teacher two. We would swap them. And so in by doing so, uh, as I mentioned before, we would increase the welfare of the teachers, the welfare of the schools based on the uh, non-modified priorities um, and uh, reduce the number of uh, blocking pairs here. Obviously, so teachers in this definition of the mechanism, a teacher in this example that I showed here, uh, a teacher is only pointing to one school. I mean, this teacher three could be pointing to two schools, but in this, without further restrictions, we might have several cycles that intersect because a teacher can have several, can be, can be blocking with several schools, um, which means that cycles can inter intersect. And in, in the definition of the block exchange mechanism, we leave it open uh, how we should select the cycles that we clear first. Um, but so this means that the block exchange, the definition we use, corresponds to a large class of mechanisms. Depending on which cycles we select, we would end up with, with a different allocation. However, in this large class of mechanisms, what we show, and that's the uh, first theorem, is that the set of possible assignments of V coincides with a set of two-sided maximal matchings. In other words, whatever way you select the cycles, we would always end up with a uh, matching that is uh, two-sided uh, maximal. The second finding is that, and an important, I think, uh, consideration is that even if all this selection of cycles would lead to a two-sided maximal matching, some selections of cycles are not strategy-proof. Um, and there, there exists actually a unique selection of cycles, so of uh, the block exchange, that is strategy proof for teachers. And so then based on this block exchange algorithm, uh, we design a second mechanism, the teacher optimal that we call teacher optimal block exchange because it happens to be the teacher optimal selection that will systematically select the strategy proof selection of cycles. And so out of this large class of mechanisms, uh, there is one selection which is strategy proof and this selection also happens to be the teacher optimal um, allocation so that there is no other selection of cycles that Pareto dominates it for teachers. And so we uh, design a mechanism uh, to systematically select this strategy proof selection of cycles and we call, the, we call it the teacher optimal block exchange to be and the, it's a modification of the block exchange mechanism that is very simple instead of allowing teachers to point to all the schools with which the teacher is blocking we only allow we do it successively and the teacher is only pointing to the school he or she prefers among all the schools that he or she is blocking with. So it's a very simple modification. Instead of having several out, uh, out ex um, outgoing arrows, we have only one. And uh, by imposing this, further, this restriction on the pointing behavior of the teachers, um, we obtain uh, the unique selection of cycles that is, that is strategy proof and teacher optimal. And you see that another way to, to present these, um, these uh, teacher optimal block exchange is also uh, by making the parallel with the way uh, the top trading cycle mechanism is working. 
because uh, in TTC, we don't restrict the schools that teachers or students can point to. But here, if we were imposing that teachers or students usually um, can only point to the schools that find them acceptable, then it would be equivalent to this um, teacher optimal block exchange. Um, and so this is, I'm not going to present the, the theory further. We have now the class of mechanisms at all, the block exchange mechanism that each uh, allocation is uh, two-sided optimal. Then we have a single uh, selection of cycles that gives a strategy proof version that is also teacher optimal. Uh, and this is actually in the empirical application, uh, we mostly focus on this teacher to be, we present all results for to be and be, but we mostly focus on this because it's, um, it's the, the mechanism that provides the strategy proof and to teacher optimal um, uh, allocation. We have two, there are two additional directions uh, we investigate in the paper. The first one is to, um, consider one-sided maximality instead of two-sided. So, so far we always wanted to find an allocation that improves upon the initial or any initial allocation for teacher and school's welfare, plus in terms of uh, fairness. If we uh, get rid of, or if we ignore um, the school's welfare side, then we, we get the one-sided maximality um, concept, um, which is targeting teachers' welfare only, not schools' welfare and fairness. Um, and so we have, um, in, the, in the interest of time, I'm not going to present all the results, but um, we have a section in the paper where we, we, we define this, uh, this concept and we show a mechanism that can systematically um, achieve one-sided maximality. And finally, all the results I've presented so far um, or telling us that we can improve upon the initial mechanism in terms of efficiency and fairness, but we um, this doesn't tell us much how far DA star, so the modified version of DA, is from being two-sided maximal. We don't have any quantification of this distance, for instance. We also say that there is, I mean, BE is a large class of mechanisms, but uh, we don't have any results on are there some allocations that are better than others in terms uh, of teacher schools welfare. And um, there is one selection of BE that is strategy proof, uh, how costly it is. What's the cost of imposing this strategy proofness uh, compared to not and selecting uh, another selection of cycles, for instance. So there, we have a large market approach in the paper where we provide additional results on these, on these three questions. And again, in the interest of time, I'm not going to present it. And I move to the empirical analysis to show you uh, our quantification of, of the, the gains that the mechanisms could improve, could uh, bring. Um, and so a bit of institutional details um, on how teacher assignment works in France. So we have two successive assignment phases. The first one is the region assignment, and the second one is the school assignment. So there are 31 regions in France. I can show you the map, which is actually not. Great, so this is the map of France. So in the first step, all teachers ask to be assigned one of these regions. And then in the second step within a region, teachers have to rank the different schools and um, the region is running the algorithm. So we have two different steps, two algorithms that run and two, uh, two, algorithm, two final allocations. Um, we consider in the empirical application teachers preferences over regions and teacher assignment to regions. There are a couple of reasons for that. Um, one is that the mechanism used is strategy proof, the modified version of deferred acceptance, and in the, the region assignment teachers can rank all regions. So they can rank, there is no limitation on the list, on the size of the list. Um, and when we do this um, analysis we an obvious question is if we consider teacher assignment to regions and the preferences submitted by teachers of our regions, what would teachers care in the end? Are these preferences of our regions well defined? Or is it that in the end teachers only care about the school they get within a region, in which case the preferences of our regions wouldn't be very well defined objects? And so we claim uh, it's obviously we don't have. Uh, final evidence on this, but we believe that 
preferences over regions are pretty well-defined objects uh, and preferences for two reasons. One is we have good evidence that the preferences seem to be lexicographic in the sense that teachers have strong preferences for regions and then within a region they might have preferences of the schools but their first the first thing they care about is the region. And so two statistics that kind of support this claim is that 78% of teachers rank a single region. And this region very often is either their birth region or the region in which their partner is located. And so it seems that teachers have a very strong preference for certain regions. Um, and the second, the second reason why we believe that even if in the end, some teachers might have preferences for some types of schools, irrespective of the region in which the school is located. Let's say some teachers I don't know, might have a preference for some disadvantaged schools. Um, in the end, we believe that the, by backward induction, the teachers might say, well, in this region, there are 10% of disadvantaged schools. So my probability of getting, once I am within this region, my probability of getting in this school is X percent. Um, given that there are significantly more participants in phase two than in phase one, so for the school allocation than for the region allocation, by backward induction, even if we change the first, the assignment to regions, the probability that teachers, their expectations of getting into the school they really like would be most likely unaffected by a change of mechanism, so that the preferences that teachers have over regions uh, is very unlikely to change if we change mechanisms. So that's, what, that's why we say that by backward induction, uh, their preferences of a region should be well-defined, even if some teachers have um, a particular preference for a type of school. Um, and so in terms of priorities, how are the priorities of the regions defined? So regions are using a point system that is defined by the central administration, and it takes into account uh, several criterion three legal priorities, like spousal reunification, whether so the teacher would have a higher priority in the region where the spouse is located. If the teacher has a disability, which is very rarely used in practice, spousal reunification is used quite a lot. And this is creating some heterogeneity between the priorities of a given teacher. So a teacher can have different priorities in different regions. And finally, having a position in a disadvantaged or violent school currently, is also uh, entering the priority. So a teacher would have a higher priority in many schools if the teacher is staying for at least five years or eight years in that school. Um, and finally, there are other common criteria like seniority in teaching and in the current school. So this is the most commonly used criteria. All teachers have points for how many years they've been in, in, uh, in the teaching profession and in the current school. Um, and uh, the time away from the spousal children. So there are other criteria, but this seniority in teaching, spousal reunification already, the, I would say the two most commonly used criteria to rank teachers. And so our uh, empirical analysis aims at quantifying exactly the, theor the theoretical findings um, we find. And so we proceed in two steps. First, we estimate teacher preferences over regions and second, we run the alternative mechanisms that we suggest. Uh, and so we quantify how much uh, they improve in terms of school and teacher welfare, in terms of fairness, and in terms of the social objectives of the social planner, which is um, the share of inexperienced teachers that are assigned in every region. So I show you results uh, in all these dimensions and I'll explain how we, how do we what kind of outcomes do we use to measure gains in school and teachers' welfare? Is there any question on this? Can I ask you a question about the previous slide? Yeah. Uh, so you're saying regions' priorities. So are schools' priorities different from regions' priorities? I think I missed that part. So you rank the regions first and then the schools. Uh, yeah. how, how does the other side work? Yeah, yeah. So, um, so in practice, maybe I was a bit fast. So even in terms of time, these are two very different uh, allocation steps. So between February and March, in February or March, teachers, this is the region assignment step. Teachers are asked to rank the different regions. Regions have priorities over teachers that are defined. They all use the same priorities. 
Um, and then the ministry, the central administration here is running the modified version of DA. We get uh, a region assignment. And then in April and May, within a region, teachers are asked to submit a list of schools. Schools have priorities over teachers. These priorities are, the criteria they use are almost identical in practice. So in the law, if you, look, if you read the regulation, the regions have some freedom in changing the priorities they use. They can add additional criterion. In practice, they don't really. I mean, when we compare the criterion that are used, um, they all reuse more or less exactly the same criterion and the same points associated with the criterion that the ministry is using for the region assignment. But in theory, they could use different criterion. And so in, in April and May then, based on the preferences of the teachers for school, and the priorities of the schools, uh, the region at the region level is running the algorithm. Yeah, I, I see. I guess what I was wondering is that, so this sort of suggests that we shouldn't really think of schools as like really strategic entities, which is reassuring because the mechanism that you were proposing was not strategy proof for schools. Yeah. And I think that's the justification. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Um, and even because clearly, so the schools at the school level, uh, they cannot decide the admission criterion they use. The region at the region level could decide, for instance, that for one additional year of experience, instead of giving, I don't know, 10 points, uh, the region would give 12, pounds, 12 uh, points. But the schools per se cannot be strategic in the sense that they cannot influence uh, the admission criterion they apply to teachers. Thank you. Um, okay, is there any other question before I continue on the institutional, because I'm, I'm going to present the data now and the estimation method we use. Okay. Um, so we use data on the assignment of secondary public school teachers to French, to French regions. Uh, so we have data on teachers, so on teachers, we have their full reported preferences. We have quite a lot of information on their characteristics, their gender, whether they are married, whether they have kids, uh, their qualification, their number of years of experience in teaching and in, the, in their current position. Um, we know their initial assignment, which we will use to, for the counterfactual analysis. We have data on regions. We know the priorities of the regions over each teacher. And we know the characteristics of the region. So I show you in the descriptive statistics these characteristics. But for instance, we know the share of disadvantaged students, where whether the regions is in south of France or not, and uh, a bunch of other information. We impose some sample restrictions for the, the empirical analysis. So we keep, in order to match the theoretical results that um, apply to teachers with an initial assignment and uh, we ignore newcomers and back-end positions, we do the same for the, for the main part of the empirical analysis. We keep teachers with an initial assignment and we drop back-end positions. We also keep the nine largest subjects, uh, which in practice represent, I think, more than 60 or seven, uh, more than 60% of the market. So these are teachers in French, math, sports, biology, physics, um, we have history and geography uh, and all these kind of large subjects that all students take. Uh, and finally, we drop couples um, because couples have specific treatments uh, in the way their preferences are handled by the ministry. And in order to not create um, any issues with the estimation and with the counterfactual, we, we decided to drop couples from the analysis. Uh, and so in our final sample, we have 6,000 teachers. Um, and so I'm showing you here some descriptive statistics on the teachers in the four larger subjects, but so we have nine subjects. Um, the share of female teachers, for instance, varies quite a lot between subjects. Um, the share of teachers in disadvantaged schools can also vary. Uh, the experience of the teachers overall doesn't vary too much. Um, and the percentage of teachers that have an advanced teaching qualification um, varies and is much is much larger in literature. And so this, I think, gives you an idea of the size. So we will do the, the preference estimations and then the counterfactual 
um, uh, simulations of uh, what would be the allocation under the current mechanism and under the other mechanisms we suggest. We do it um, subject by subject because obviously each field, each subject is a separate market. Um, and so slightly more descriptive statistics on the regions now. So I'm presenting here the regions that teachers are initially assigned to in panel A and the regions that teachers rank first in panel B. And I think there are a few interesting patterns here. Uh, if you look, for instance, at the, the region teachers are coming from, teachers are, are very likely to come from Créteil or Versailles, which I described as being the two regions close to Paris that are particularly disadvantaged. So you see that in sports, for instance, 70% um, of uh, the, regi the regions initially assigned to is uh, Créteil or Versailles. It's lower in other regions, but if you compare these two, the region that teachers rank first, it's 1% um, in sports, uh, 2, 3, 3% in other fields. So we, here we see the difference in the uh, the unbalanced in where teachers are coming from and where teachers want to go. Um, there are also quite large differences in whether the regions is in south of France, quite few teachers who have reached south of France, which is considered as a desirable location, ask to move away. Um, and that many teachers are ranking a region is in, in south of France as their first region. Um, and so similarly, few teachers, once they've reached their birth region, ask to move away. Um, but many teachers are ranking their, their region of birth as the first region. So we see clearly here that there are some patterns, some regions that want to be left and some regions that want to be joined. Um, and so in order to estimate, so we start the first step is to estimate teachers' preferences. We use a pretty standard utility function uh, where the utility of teacher T for region R is a function of a set of region fixed effects. Some characteristics of the regions that we interact with the characteristics of the teachers. And uh, so beta will be the coefficient on these coefficients and uh, an error term, which is uh, IID of a T and R, and as is very standard, uh, we use a type one extreme value distribution, a gumball, um, that, um, yeah. So I think, I mean, nothing really extraordinary in this, in this utility function. I think an important consideration we had and we faced is what kind of identifying assumptions do we use um, in order to estimate the preferences? And in the literature, there are I think either we, the first identifying assumption is to assume that the reported preferences are truthful. In other words, uh, the ranking we observe corresponds to the tr true preferences of the teachers. Um, and then we use, it's very standard to use a mixed logic uh, to estimate. So we leverage the fact that we have a ranking, which is providing lots of information on the preferences um, of the teachers. And we use this ranking to estimate the preferences. It has been a standard approach in the literature. Uh, another uh, assumption, because this is, this is quite demanding, I mean, assuming truthfulness is a very strong requirement, especially given the increasing um, evidence on the fact that even when we have a mechanism that is strategy proof and that teachers or students can rank, oh, there is no limitation on the size of the list, we know that many students and teachers fail to uh, be trustful and that the reported preferences often don't match the true preferences, even in this kind of first best environment. And so an alternative assumption is to not assume that the reported preferences are trustful, but to, um, to recognize that teachers and students, but teachers in our case, uh, often decide to skip the, from their ranking, the regions that are perceived as unreachable or unfeasible. And so it's an, it's, it's an important um, specific type of strategy because under a mechanism that is stable, it's outcome neutral. In other words, the fact that if teachers have a very accurate uh, perception of which regions or which schools are unachievable and they skip these schools from their ranking, the outcome of the assignment would be the same. Uh, and so 
you know, uh, under this very, uh, under this assumption that teachers might skip unfeasible regions from their ranking, um, we can still run the estimation under a slightly uh, different assumption, which is that teachers conditional on observing their feasible set of regions. So these are all the regions where the teacher exposed has a priority that is higher than the minimum cutoff. We observe this set of feasible regions and the estimation is based on the assumption that the teacher has been assigned his or her favorite region among this set of feasible regions. So it's a slightly different assumption. It doesn't require full truth fooling, which is often invalidated or sometimes invalidated. Um, and so we run these two, these um, estimations under both sets of assumptions in our data, where for a number of reasons, it's kind of likely that some teachers might adopt these strategies of skipping the unfeasible regions. And in, in, indeed, we reject truthfulling by adopting the, the Hosman test. I have to say that here, when we do this estimation, we just reuse the methodology that has been suggested by um, Gabriel Fack, Julien Grenand, and Yung Guahe. We didn't uh, invent anything on that on that front. So, and when we compare, we use their Hosman test, we reject truthfulling, uh, truth, uh, truth telling. And also we find that we compute, so we create some measures of goodness, of goodness of fit, where we look at how well the model predicts teachers' reported preferences. And when we compare how well the model predicts uh, the reported preferences under stability and truthfulness, we find that the model does much better under the stability assumption. So for estimation, we use this stability assumption. I might be, so, this is showing you for two subjects um, the, the, the estimated preferences. Well, in the interest of time, I might not spend too much time, but just to show you that. So, and this is a selected sample of parameters. We find indeed that the non attractive regions have very negative coefficients, and these coefficients are relative to Paris. Um, we find that the birth region tends to be very attractive, that the distance to the current region tends to reduce the attractiveness, and then we have a bunch of interactions between the school, the region's characteristics and teacher's characteristics. Well, um, and we, overall, we have a pretty good fit, and our fit measure is we observe the ranking in the, in the submitted list. We, we take the first two submitted regions, we look at their ranking, and we check if in our predicted ranking, we find the same order of preferences. And so this is what the fit measure is reporting. And overall, we find pretty good fit measures. I would say very good fit measures even. And so now, so once we have done this prediction exercise, I showed you the, here, the utility function, then we draw the, the error term 5,000 times. And this, based on these, um, these simulations and these draws, we predict the reported preferences with the preferences of the teachers. And based on every prediction, then we run the uh, algorithms. We run the current algorithm, the modified version of DA. And we also run um, our the block exchange algorithm, the 2B, teacher optimal block exchange, which is the strategy perversion. And we also run the one-sided block exchange, which uh, I didn't present. And so now I will present the counterfactual results. So in the counterfactual analysis, what we do is first we try to quantify the, the first claim of the theoretical of the theory part was that uh, the modified version of different acceptance was inefficient. And so what we do in the, in the counterfactual analysis is we quantify how inefficient the modified version of DA is. So that's the first thing we do. And then we move uh, to quantifying the performance of the uh, teacher optimal block exchange algorithm. So what we found is that the A star, the modified version of DA is not two-sided maximal, uh, and that can it can be improved upon in terms of teacher welfare, region welfare, and fairness. And so one way to test this empirically is to run the current algorithm, the modified version of deferred acceptance. We look at this, we consider this allocation as the initial allocation, and on top from this allocation, we run the teacher optimal block exchange. And so we know that any cycle, any block exchange that we can implement would be improving upon the A star in terms of teacher and school welfare and in terms of, of uh, fairness. 
So that's what we do. We run to be on top of the install. Um, and every time the assignments differ, it means, it means that the install was not two sided maximum. What we, oh, so what we find is that in every single case, TA store is not two-sided maximal. And when we compare the number of teachers we match under DA store, the current algorithm, and under the combination of 2B and DA store, we find that we would match or we would allow four times more teachers to change position or to, to get a new assignment under the combination of 2BDA uh, than under the current mechanism. So it seems that the A-star is indeed very far from uh, being two-sided maximal. And then we try to understand what is causing this inefficiency. And so we go back to the leading example. And when I presented the, this example of having one teacher with a high experience in a disadvantaged region that is preventing other teachers from exchanging positions in the current, um, in the current mechanism, the modified version of the A, we identify, so when we start, when we run to be on top of the A star, every time there is a cycle, a potential cycle, we check if that cycle would be blocked by a teacher from a disadvantaged region that has a high priority and that stays in his, his or her disadvantaged region. And so we find that almost all cycles would be blocked so that this is kind of empirically validating um, the, the, the leading example that we had. Hey, can I ask something very quickly? Yeah. This number 957, is it using the filled in preferences that you derived earlier? Like you stacked these like the top of these preferences or is it using the original preferences submitted by teachers? No, it, now all the counterfactual is done on the predicted preferences. So we estimate preference, the preferences using the utility function. Then in the utility function, we draw the error term 5,000 times. And this 957 is actually an average across these 5,000 uh, simulation draws and across uh, all subjects as well. Oh, so I see. Do you know if you get like a comparable number if you just use the original preferences or is it... Much yeah, 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 we were, so actually, uh, so initially we were using the reported preferences and then mm -hmm. um, one of the referee suggested to, to estimate the preferences. So we went through a very long estimation period uh, and actually the results uh, ended up, I think, being slightly better or better. Uh, the, the improvements we find are larger under the estimated preferences than under the reported preferences not by a lot. Like the main results we, I, I show in two slides, I think, which is that th this is based on the A star. So I think the main counterfactual exercise we're interested in is just looking at the initial assignment and running any of the mechanisms we suggest. And the main, one of the main results is that when we run to B, um, the mobility increases by um, between two and three times. And I think this is more or less the same when we use the reported preferences and the simulated, uh, the, the, the estimated preferences. The advantage of, to be honest, now that we can compare both, the advantage of using the reported preferences is that we had a larger market because we were doing it for uh, how many? We had 49 subjects. So here we use the nine larger subjects because these subjects have a large enough number of teachers to run the estimations. Uh, when we were doing the counterfactuals on the whole, on the, without using the, the estimated preferences, we had more subjects, but in the end, there are many subjects with very few teachers. So we were, we were keeping the subjects that had more than 10 teachers. Um, and yeah, that's the main difference. Yeah. Okay, I have one question, if yes. I may. I'm very much curious about this 0.5% of the cycles which are not attributed to these teachers initially assigned by uh, the system, in the, the teachers who, whose, whose priorities are shifted by the system. The thing is that, you know, if suppose that priorities are such that we do not lead to shift anybody's initial priority, then we shouldn't expect to have any of these cycles, you know? 
So that does this 0.5% is coming. Shouldn't that be 100%? So what would you just a measurement that I didn't know, but uh, I'm surprised by, by that 0.5%. What are they coming from? The 0.5%, you mean? Of yeah, exactly, exactly. Non -blocked. Non -blocked. Yeah. Why, uh, okay, why would you expect to, that all, every single cycle would be blocked by a teacher from a disadvantaged region? No, uh, because you might have cycles that, so typically, you might have cycles... Okay. Huh, I see, I'm sorry, so these two regions are disadvantaged regions? Because like, sorry, and... from disadvantaged okay. regions. Okay, yeah. okay, okay, fine, fine, yeah. fine. I misunderstood it. Please ignore that. Sorry. Uh, no, no. Uh, so, yeah, if you have an exchange, for instance, um, among two teachers, so if we go back to the example where we had the two regions uh, at the top and the, the teacher here from the disadvantaged region, um, any exchange between high experience, high priority teachers might not be blocked. Okay. Okay, got it, got it, got it, fine, fine, fine. This, this is clear, I'm sorry now, I, I okay. understood. Um, I have a um, quick comment, and the first comment is that this is like, I mean, the size of your improvement is dramatic, but it's not going to occur every single year. After a few years of running this algorithm, if they were to select this algorithm, then the improvement would decrease. So it's sort of like a, going to be a static improvement. It's not going to show up every single year. And the second comment is that this sort of means that people in going to a disadvantaged region in the first place is sort of like a death sentence, according to your estimates. You know, I mean, I, I agree that what you're doing is you're improving things for other people, but it means that if you're stuck in one of those bad regions, then you're stuck. Yeah. So uh, on the first, clearly, I think that the dynamic aspect of it, uh, so we can't tell much what would happen after one year, uh, two years or three years of implementation. Um, it's not, I mean, there are two considerations, I think, here. If the mobility is much larger, currently there might be some teachers that are discouraged from participating in the mobility process because they think that their chances of moving are too low. Uh, so, of course, I mean, we, we can only uh, have expectations of how the mobility would change one year uh, after the implementation, two years and three years. I think it's not completely clear. It might, the improvements we find might go down, but it might also be the case that if, because the mobility improves so much, uh, the pool of participants increases, in which case we might also have room for more exchanges. Then obviously it's related to a more, much more difficult question to address, which is the endogenous entry of participants into the market, which I think goes beyond. Um, it's, it's a super interesting question, but I, I think it's not, yeah, it's not completely clear um, that the mobility would necessarily go down dramatically in year two or three. It might, but except if, if the pool of applicants increases. And your second point was on, what was again your second comment? Pardon. Um, my second point was that it seems like one thing that your model is saying is that going to a bad region is a death sentence. I mean, you're stuck there and there's nothing you can do. But that's true in the current algorithm, but it's somewhat of a concern. I agree, yeah. Um, so I agree with that point. Um, it's true that, and when we look at the mobility improvements, it improves more for uh, non-disadvantaged students, non-disadvantaged uh, regions than for the disadvantaged regions. And that's something clearly, um, that could be, I mean, in terms of implementation, there are things that could be considered because we actually exchanged with the Ministry of Education on this and um, they were brainstorming on ways to uh, increase mobility from uh, disadvantaged uh, regions, for instance, by either considering for how many years the teacher has been asking to move away. Um, but overall, I mean, I agree with you with your point that 
the mobility improvements we have is larger in non-disadvantaged regions than in disadvantaged regions. Then it's also currently the case that teachers, as you say, teachers in disadvantaged regions already don't move. And if we multiply by three the mobility, um, we, don't, we don't exactly multiply it by three for these teachers. So the situation doesn't necessarily get worse for them. It's either it stays the same or it even improves a bit, but not as much as in other regions. Um, and that's, yeah, that's a fair point. This is actually something we are considering. So in, in the conclusion, I'm mentioning a, uh, an ongoing work we do on the distributional considerations, which focuses much more on experienced teachers versus inexperienced teachers and disadvantaged regions versus non-disadvantaged regions. Um, it's with um, Umut Dur and uh, Utku Unver. Uh, and so this is something we consider more carefully in this, uh, in this work. Okay, so given that I have, I think, five minutes left, um, I, let me show you the rest of the results. So in terms of teachers' welfare, we use two measures of teacher welfare, how many teachers move and the rank of the region that they obtain. And so the second fact we find, and so now let me clarify that all the simulations I'm presenting are based on, we observe the initial assignment of the teachers and we run the teacher optimal block exchange or any other mechanism, but it's really based on the initial assignment. Uh, so this, or, this is equivalent to what we would get if we were replacing the algorithm that the ministry is currently using. And so we find that there are 657 additional teachers that move under 2B compared to the A star, which is an increase of like, between two and three times of the mobility. The number of teachers who obtain their preferred region is also going up by 54%. And so I'm quickly showing you, we plot the distribution of the number of teachers who get their rank one, two, three, four, five for the different mechanisms. And so when we compare this distribution under the modified version of DA and under, under 2B, we find that there is a first order stochastic dominance where teachers systematically get a uh, higher rank uh, in terms of stochastic dominance under 2B than under DA. Uh, okay, this is for teachers' welfare. Uh, ah, and we also consider what is driving the reassignment magnitudes under 2B. Uh, so if we compare the different regions, there are different elements that might explain how much you can, um, the share of teachers that manage to move away from a region. The first determinant is the number of applicants to a region. The more people are asking to enter a region, the larger the possibility for teachers in this region to leave the region. So that is the first very intuitive determinant. And the second one is the priority of the existing teachers. So if you are a high priority teacher, given that you can only move if you block with a region, it's more likely that you will be able to move to another region if you, are, if you have a high priority, because then you would be able to replace uh, an existing teacher. And so what we show here is a very strong correlation between the share of teachers who move away from every single region and the ratio of the number of entering teacher uh, over the number of uh, exiting requests. So how many teachers asked to enter re the region over how many teachers asked to leave the region. And they, clearly there seems to be uh, a correlation between both, which is not, I think it's pretty intuitive um, and it's just purely correlational here, but uh, I think this seems to explain how much um, DA, how much to be can improve the mobility. Then we look at, so we've looked at the performance of to be in terms of teacher, uh, teacher welfare. Uh, we also improve in terms of fairness and we have two different measures of fairness, the number of teachers that have no justified envy for another school and four teachers that have justified envy with how many regions do they have justified envy. Uh, and so again, we look at, yeah. Uh, and so what we find is that when we compare 2B and DA star, the number of teachers who are not part of a blocking pair is increasing from uh, by 34%. And as we did previously, if we compare the, if we look at the distribution of the number of regions teachers can block with, starting from zero, one, two, three, four regions and plus, and we find that the distribution under 2B stochastically dominates the distribution under DA star. And because we start at zero, it means that we have significantly more teachers 
all along the distribution that are not blocking or that are blocking with uh, fewer regions under 2B than under DA star. Uh, finally, we look at, uh, I mean, almost finally, we look at measures of regions, uh, welfare that we measure by looking at the priorities of the teachers that are assigned each region and in order to do that, it, it's not, it wasn't completely straightforward because we are in a many to one environment. So for each region, we consider two matchings. We rank the teachers by decreasing order of priorities. And for each position, we look at whether the incoming teacher has a higher priority than the exiting teacher. And then once we've done this exercise, our outcome is a net improvement measure where we compare the percentage of positions that receive a higher priority teacher and the percentage of positions that receive a lower priority teacher. And we subtract both. And so once we, we then, we, uh, we look at the distribution, the number of the distribution of regions with um, a net improvement in these positions. Well, and so what we find is that, again, the distribution of regions welfare under 2B stochastically dominates the distribution under the A-star. We don't find, I mean, according to their theory, we don't find that any region that has seats assigned lower priority teachers under 2B. This is by definition, because 2B has to improve both for teachers and for schools. And vice versa, because the A-star is not two-sided maximal, so the A-star can harm regions in terms of the priority of the teachers that replaces an existing teacher. We find that on average, 1.7 regions have more than 10% of their seats that are assigned to teachers with a net lower priority under the ASTOR. Um, all right, and last set of results, I promise, or should I wrap it? Well, in terms of social objectives, we look at the share of uh, inexperienced teachers. So these are teachers with one or two years of experience that are assigned either uh, disadvantaged regions or non-disadvantaged regions. That's a bit of a heavy table, but what I show here is the share of inexperienced teachers, one or two years of experience among all teachers, among incoming teachers, and among exiting teachers. And what we show is we mostly care about disadvantaged regions where 50% of the teachers in disadvantaged regions have only one or two years of experience. This is reducing slightly under 2B. And vice versa, if we look at non-disadvantaged regions, 27% only of the teachers have only one or two years of experience, and it's increasing under 2B. So we have this kind of redistribution of the, of the inexperienced teachers between disadvantaged and non-disadvantaged regions. So let me, all right, skip. We have additional results on 2B, one-sided B, and also we run simulations on the entire market. The results are quite consistent with what the theory would predict. And let me conclude to say that, um, so in this paper, we show that the mechanism that is currently used in France is strategy proof, but um, it can be improved in terms of efficiency for teachers in schools and in terms of fairness. And in our analysis, we identify a unique strategy proof mechanism that performs better, both theoretically and empirically, um, and so, as I was mentioning just before, we have a companion research that is now investigating more, um, more specifically the distributional considerations uh, with a distinction, a very clear distinction between disadvantaged and non-disadvantaged regions and uh, low experience and high experience teachers. And the idea is, if we had a targeted distribution in mind, can we design mechanisms that allow to target some distribution of teachers in regions? And so that's a joint ongoing work with uh, Olivier, uh, Olivier Tercier, Julien Combe, and uh, Umut Duran Utkumbe. Uh, related to that, the last point, uh, do you have in mind changing the priorities or changing the mechanism? The, the last paper, the extension that we are talking about. Yeah, so in the extension, um, we, it's, uh, it, well, both. Uh, both. Right. Both, yeah. Uh, it's uh, the mechanisms differ uh, because there is, I mean, there are two mechanisms we consider. One that is based on a version of deferred acceptance or similar to deferred acceptance and another one that is much closer to TTC. And in both case, uh, the priorities okay. uh, also changed. Um, so, yeah. I see. I see. Uh, one related paper to that 
put on the side of uh, you know what sorts of priorities would achieve these distributions. Desired distributions can be a Chenikent uh, Yenmas uh, AER paper in which they analyze these different priorities that aim to capture diversity. Uh, mm. Just as something related, and if I may, uh, I have one little technical question. Uh, here is the thing. We know that the outcome of your mechanism, Pareto dominates the outcome of the modified DA algorithm for teachers, right? So it, it does if we run our mechanism on top of the current one, but in most of the simulations we do, we should be careful when we compare them because we run the modified DA from the initial assignment and we run the 2B from the initial assignment. So in that case, we don't have the, power to the direct power to domination. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. That is what uh, sort yeah. of I have in mind. Uh, and in that case, can you also say that yours is Pareto efficient at least? It may so, not Pareto dominate, but yours, yours turns out to be Pareto efficient. Yes. Okay, yeah. fine. What I would add is the following. And okay, and modified DA may not be Pareto efficient. Yeah. That is what we know. Yeah. Okay, let me add by referring to an old and less known paper. The outcome of DA, even with this modified version, is going to be weak to Pareto efficient. It is not Pareto efficient, but it is weak to Pareto efficient in the sense that you cannot make everybody, every teacher, strictly better. Uh, it goes back to Gale and Sotomayor, mid 80s, discrete applied mathematics. Well, your approach to priorities are a little different, but I can see that the same argument would work and still uh, DA is going to give you something weakly Pareto efficient. Uh, that is, you know, I'm just advocating DA for the sake yeah. of advocating it, uh, but nothing other than that. Thanks. Okay, thanks. No, that's very useful. Um, but clearly, I think that's something I didn't uh, stress enough. So yeah, when we do the comparison between the modified version of DA and to be the, the theoretical re results we have on the fact that to be is reaching an allocation that is uh, two-sided optimal. We should be very careful when we compare DA. I mean, DA exactly. and uh, yeah, yeah, that completely. Exactly, agree. that is the thing. And on that front, DA is doing quite well. It is not Pareto efficient, but mm -hmm. it is weakly Pareto efficient. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, I think we are running out of time. So, Kami, thank you very much for this presentation. Really appreciate your time uh, and your efforts uh, in, that you dedicate to us. We hope to see all of the follow-up papers in our future seminars as well. Okay. Yeah, I hope so. Thanks so much for inviting me and for all the comments. That was really, really helpful. And, uh, I, I wish I could be there in person, but uh, maybe, maybe next time. <laughs> next time, next time. <laughs> Uh, okay. All right. Thank you very much. So I'm going to stop.